Good deal, good deal. Uh, let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. <clears throat> Father, we come before you right now, Lord, and I'm so thankful for this day. I'm thankful that it is the day we come together as sold out church and corporately together fellowship in your name celebrating the fact that we have victory over sin and death father i'm so thankful for the faces that make it here every sunday morning when we come together but lord we know we know we're not a church it's just a sunday church and we're not just a wednesday church but father we want to be sold out to you 24 hours a day seven days a week so father i thank you for people that you've led here that are like that that are living their faith Father, I thank you that we have the opportunity to grow together, to strive together, to learn more and more every single day how to live out our faith. And that's why we come on Sundays to learn even more about how to live our faith and to celebrate that you, you have provided a way for us to come to you through your son Jesus. And Father, we're so thankful. We thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. We thank you for your love. And we thank you that today I'm not going to be speaking, but you're going to be speaking through me because we need to hear from you. So, Father, get me out of the way. Anoint my tongue. Anoint my throat. Give it strength. Father, I pray that this message will be fruitful, that their ears will be opened, their hearts will be soft, and the seeds will be planted today that will grow, that will grow so that the seeds that are planted will develop in these men and women to where they can feed from these seeds. Father, I ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Alright, so the past three, two weeks, we've been talking about the red letter day. The day that Jesus was crucified. We've talked about the things that Jesus said from the cross. In the first week, we talked about my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And in that message, we really learned that as we come to know Him more, we stop asking why as much. There's less of a why and more of a what. Not why did He say it, what is He saying? He said it for us. He says things for us so that we will come to know Him, so we can glorify Him. So what is He saying? And we learned that. And we learned that even during those moments on the cross, that Jesus knew that God is good, God was with Him, and God is for Him. Just the same, God is good, God is with us, and God is for us. That will never, ever, ever change. God will always be good, and He will always be with you, and He is always for you. If God is for us, we are more than conquerors, right? So last week, we had a little somber message. Everybody, everybody was kind of just really thinking about some things as we all took a hit. I took a hit preparing that message as we looked at forgiving others. As we looked at forgiving others, we looked at the parable of the forgiving servant. And we realized through that message, through, or through that parable, that oftentimes, oftentimes, the one who owes cannot repay. The forgiving servant, he could not repay. There was no way he could repay that $3.6 billion by today's money that he owed. There was no way. But we also learned that the one who is owed the debt can show mercy. We talked about how we all need to show mercy because the Bible says that we will be forgiven according to how we forgive others. And we all have people in our lives that we need to forgive. And I promised you at the end of that message that next week, this week here, would be more encouraging. And it will be because this week what we're going to do is we're going to take that principle from week one Less of why and more of what and look at something else that Jesus said from the cross. So picking up today on John uh, chapter 19 verses 28 through 30. Jesus says in John chapter 28, 19 verse 28, later, knowing that all was complete was all now completed. See, Jesus lived a life that was not circumstantial. Okay? A lot of us, our lives, we live based upon circumstances. And circumstances control us. Circumstances create emotional crises in our lives. And circumstances make, make us say things that we don't mean. And we mean things that we don't say. But not Jesus. Not Jesus. Jesus wasn't circumstantial. circumstantial. He was calculated. Everything He said was for a reason. 
Everything was a teachable moment. Everything. It was all calculated. So, if it's all calculated, what's being calculated here? Well, you have to know that a lot of what Jesus said was in fulfillment of prophecy, of messianic prophecy from the Old Testament. If we look at Daniel, we look at Isaiah, we look in the Psalms, all the way back to Deuteronomy, Genesis, we see these messianic prophecies. And oftentimes what Jesus said was in fulfillment of them. And look at what it says in this verse. And so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. Now that's kind of strange. He, so the scripture would be fulfilled. He said, how come it doesn't say because he was thirsty, he said, I'm thirsty. So the scripture would be fulfilled. He said, I'm thirsty. He said, I thirst. In the King James it says, I thirst. Not I pod or I Mac or I Google. I thirst. Now, what is Jesus telling us here? What is he saying? Look at what they did in verse 29. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, he said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head. He gave up the spirit. What does he mean when he says, I thirst? Knowing that everything is calculated, that everything is for a reason, I have to question how thirsty Jesus was at this moment because it says to fulfill Scripture. And see, if we go all the way back, hearing about I thirst, if we go all the way back into Exodus chapter 17, the children of Israel have left Egypt. They've left Egypt. And they're out in the wilderness now. They're wandering around in the wilderness. And there's not a lot there. And they're getting frustrated. They're out in this desert. They're getting frustrated. And they say, Man, why Moses? Why did you lead us out here? So we could wander around and die of thirst? I thirst! They said, I thirst. And what happened? in that story. Y'all remember what happens in Exodus chapter 17? That water comes from a rock? Well, we know that Jesus is the rock. Jesus is the rock. So, He's taking us back and showing us something right here. The Israelites said, I thirst. And Jesus goes back to a time where He reminds them that He is the rock. But there's more to this. That, that's not just it. See, they said during that story, is God amongst us or is He not? Because we're out here and we're thirsty. Is God amongst us or is He not? And you remember the, why, my God, have you forsaken me? It wasn't exactly what it seemed. Jesus is once again pointing out something to people. They asked one time, is our God with us or is He not? And Jesus takes them back to a place through His words where He says, here I am. I'm here before you. So much so that the centurion ended up saying, surely, this is the Son of God. Surely, this is the Son of God. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. <coughs> for those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. See, the kingdom of God is about a relationship with Him. And it's about thirsting for His righteousness. Not our righteousness. Because we have no righteousness. Our righteousness is but filthy rags for His righteousness. I do not do what I do because of who I am. I do what I do because of who I already am. Because of what He did. And I have to seek Him. He changed me. He made me who I am. I did not become who I am. And I think if we start looking at Scripture, we can see that Jesus was telling us something in this I thirst. And it's more than just that rock. Have, have you ever been like really, really, really thirsty? I'm talking about like where your tongue feels like cake batter. You know, it's just thick sticky and that, that thing, what's that thing? <laughs> when he nurses that thing that hangs in the back of your throat? The what? Yeah, that thing. 
That thing, it gets so sticky that like if you cough, it like sticks to the roof of your mouth and you have to like peel it down, you know? Or when you swallow, it's like stuck in the back and you're like <coughs> trying to get it to come back down because it's just stuck. Y'all know what I'm talking about. When you're really, really thirsty. I remember when I ran the gauntlet back in September. Man, it's not that I was like dehydrated thirsty, but I was running and it was, it was on this dirty trail and we're running, and it was about two miles before we got to the first water station. And that's not a big deal out on a track or running down the road, but when you're running behind people and they're kicking up all this dirt, I was so, so incredibly thirsty. I mean, it was bad. I mean, it was really, really nasty in my mouth at the moment. It just tasted bad, it was sticky, it was hot dry and I was thirsty. So, so thirsty. Have you ever been in your life in a moment where you just really, really, really thirsty? Have you ever been there? See, I don't think that on the cross that Jesus was that thirsty. I don't think he was at that place where it was just that nasty in his mouth because let's remember something about Jesus, okay? Earlier in Scripture, after he's, a, after he's baptized, what does he do for 40 days and 40 nights? Jesus goes off in the wilderness with no food and with no water. And Jesus is tempted by Satan himself. Now, I know that we have an enemy, but I'm going to tell you right now, I don't feel worthy to be tempted by Satan himself. Maybe one of his minions but I'm not a big enough blip on the radar for Satan himself to come. I don't believe I am. Jesus, on the other hand, was a big enough blip on the radar that Satan himself came and tempted him. And this man, the Son of God, had not ate or drank for 40 days and 40 nights. And when Satan came and tempted him, did he give in to temptation? No, he did not. Not. This is a man who knows how to do without. So I really believe that on the cross there's more to this I thirst than just Jesus wanting something to drink. I think there's more to it. And I really think it had more to do with what we can give. What we can give. I think Jesus was trying to show us not about what we need but what we can give. I want to show this to you. I want us to take a look. We're, we're, we're going to go on a journey here. We're, we're going to look at thirst and how thirst will lead us to this place where we can give. And we all thirst for something. We really do. We're all thirsty. Maybe we're thirsting in our marriage. Maybe we're thirsting at a job. Maybe we're thirsting in ministry. Maybe we're thirsting. We believe that there's more for us. And let me tell you, God wants you to have those things. But first, He wants you to get to a place where it's not about what He can do for you, but about what you can do. God wants us to get to that place where it's about what we can do. It's about where it's, where it's not about me being satisfied, but about Him. But your Christianity is giving back. But your Christianity is giving back. It's not where it's just to support me, but to give to other people. So, do you remember when we was doing worship? soon. And I took us to that place in John chapter 4 and we read about Jesus meeting the woman at the well. And I told you that day more was coming from this. I was using that we worship in spirit and truth so we would understand how we worship. But I told you that day that more was coming. And I want to go back to that story today. I want to go back to John chapter 4. I want to tell you we're going to read almost the whole chapter so don't fall asleep. Alright, don't fall asleep on me. I don't have the paintball gun, but I have plenty of stuff to throw. Alright, don't go to sleep. Let's start reading in John chapter 1. Now, I'll tell you real quick. I'm reading from the NIV. I prefer the NIV. I don't know what you prefer. Some of you prefer the KJV. Some of you the NLT. I like the NIV. It's a good balance between being able to understand it and staying very, very literal word for word from the original Hebrew and Greek. It tries to keep that. I don't read from the King James Version very often. I will look at it for certain things, but I don't speak Old English. Therefore, I don't read Old English, just like I don't read or speak Chinese, so I don't read Chinese. 
I speak with today's common English, so I need a Bible that I can read and understand. And I'm telling you, regardless of what anyone might say, the NIV was the instrument that God used to change my life. Because someone put an NIV Bible in my hand, and man, it was game on. I started seeing things I never saw, and the Spirit really started teaching. So, we're reading from NIV today. You read from whatever you want. I'm just telling you what we're reading from today. Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea, and he went back once more to Galilee. Now, he had to go through Samaria. So when he came into a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph, Jacob's well was there. And Jesus... Tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? Jesus says, I thirst. He says right here, I thirst. His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. And we talked about when I talked about this last time, men didn't speak to unknown women, especially teachers speaking to unknown women, especially Jewish teachers to Samaritan women. This was a big deal, so she's like, why are you asking me this? And Jesus said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked Him and He would have given you living water. See, we're getting to something here. Jesus started this conversation with her by saying, I thirst. And then they start talking about her need, not his, her need. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself? As did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whosoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. See, I think that's a picture of Christianity, a spring of water welling up, bubbling up so much that you can share a drink with others. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. And he told her, Go and call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. See, Jesus is calling out sin here. He's calling out sin in her life, and she wants no part of it. She avoids it. She skips right on along there. She's like, Oh, I see your prophet. I see your prophet. Let me ask you a question. Let me talk about something else. Not my sin. Let's talk about something other than my sin. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus said, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. For salvation is from the Jews. What does that mean? It's real simple. Jesus was a Jew. Salvation is from the Jews. Jesus was a Jewish man. Salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and now has come when the fathers, or when, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. We talked about that a few weeks ago. We know what that means to worship in spirit and truth. It says, God is spirit. Or the woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to me. Then Jesus declared, I love this. Joe knows how much I love this. Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am He. If you don't understand the significance of Jesus saying, I am He, we need to go back and revisit something. Jesus claims right here fully who He is. He claims deity when He says, I am He. He is quoting what God says about Himself in the book of Isaiah when God says, Listen to me, Israel, the Jewish people. Listen to me. Listen to me, O house of Jacob, whom I've called. I am He. I am the first and I am the last. 
and by my right hand I created all things, and when I raise my hands, it all stands up together. Jesus makes a very, very, very powerful statement here. And what's important is Jesus did not tell everybody who he was. He didn't reveal who he was to every single person, but he did to this woman. He revealed something to her. And when he's on the cross and he says, I thirst, he's going back to a place where we're going to understand something. So let's, let's finish reading this. So just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking with her? They were scared to ask Jesus those types of things. So then, leaving her water jar, the woman went back to town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, Could someone have brought him food? My food, Jesus said, my food is to do the will of Him who sent me and to finish His work. I came to know Christ at an early age. But it was a long, long, long process getting to where I am today. It was this huge transition from where I was then to where I am now. You all know that. We talked about a lot of that last week. There was this long journey. A long journey. Transitioning to where I needed something. I needed security. I needed help to a place where I can stand up here and pour into you. Or we can hang out together. And I can pour into you in our intimate fellowship times. Not on Sundays. Because it's not all about Sunday, is it? This is just what I do on Sundays is pour into you on Sundays. What on Tuesday when we're hanging out? Or what about Friday night, guys? Did we not have some fun Friday night? And did we not learn some things? And was there not some ministry going on up in here? There, there was some ministry going on up in here Friday night. It wasn't all about fun. It was also about Jesus. We came together and some ministry was going on. We ate good. We played good. We prayed good. And we had a great message from Nathan. It was pretty <laughs> awesome. Um, it's not all about fun. It, and it took a long time to get from that place where I needed to where I could give back. And Jesus on the cross, when He's saying this, I think maybe He's pointing out how to go from this place where we need, where we're a needy person, to being needed. Because when we get this well within us, bubbling up within us, then we can pour it back out. But only when that living water is springing up, welling up within us, can we do that? If we don't have living water within us, what are we going to pour out? We can't pour out anything that will save. We can't pour out anything that will grow. So Jesus, on the cross, He's stuck. He's in captivity right there. I mean, that's pure bondage. Pure bondage. We think about our bondage, how we are, how we're stuck, but Jesus was nailed to the cross. He was stuck. He was in real captivity. It wasn't about what he needed. It was about what he could give. Jesus was showing something that he could give. So today I want to talk about a few things in this story. Points that will help us to understand how to get from a place where it's about me to a place where it's about you. My life is not about what I need, but about what you need. That's what we're going to talk about because that's what this story is showing us. And I think that Jesus is taking us back to this time because, see, this actually became a rather famous event because that woman, that woman, when she went back to her village, in verse 39, if I went further, in verse 39 it says, and many in her village came to believe because of her testimony. See, it took me a long time to get there. But her minutes, boom, she got it. She left her water jar, folks. And she went, she started ministering. And many in her village came to believe because of her testimony. And word of that spread, that got around. People knew 
about the woman Jesus met at the well, the woman at the well that Jesus said, I thirst, give me something to drink. And then she says something to him, and he's like, you know what? I have water for you. That story was pretty popular. It would have got around because just like if it was on Facebook today, wouldn't that get around? Wouldn't we all be sharing that? We'd be sharing it. And word of mouth spread. And people were talking about this whole village and all of a sudden comes to know Christ. Why did it come to know Christ? It all started when Jesus sat down with this woman and says, I'm thirsty. Jesus is always, always using things to point to who He is. He wants us to know that. So we're going to look at a few things in that particular story today. And we're going to call them need, see, and feed. So need is... The woman, she had a need. She came to the water, the well, to get water herself. Jesus had sat down for rest. She came with her jar to get water. The woman had a need. What is the seed? Verse 10 um, says, if you knew who you were asking, if you knew who you were asking, the seed of Abraham, the seed of creation, the firstborn among the living. The firstborn among the dead. He is the seed of creation. The seed. And when we have that seed, we start finding hope. He's the seed of the woman in the book of Revelation that's chased by the dragon. Jesus is the seed. And He says, if you knew who I am, you would have asked me. If you know that the seed of life Right here, you would have asked me. And then feed. Verse 31, the disciples, man, they went to get him something to eat. And this is the funniest part of the story. They go to get him something to eat. And they come back and they're like, Jesus, you ready to eat? And he's like, no, I'm good. And they're like, you're good? Somebody get you a Big Mac or something? I mean, we went to get food. We, we <coughs> went to get the food. We come back and you're talking about you already ate? I didn't know Domino's existed 2,000 years ago. How'd you get a pizza out here this quick? How'd you eat? And Jesus, what did He say? My food, my food is to do the will of the Father. Have you ever been like spiritually, or have you ever been physically hungry and you'll do something for the Lord and you'll forget all about your hunger? Like you ever been going maybe somewhere, like you're fixing to pull into McDonald's and Maybe you're going to get a Big Mac, since I mentioned Big Macs, it just seems perfect. And you're going to get a Big Mac and you get out because the drive through line's on and, and you walk up and then someone you know is walking out and you start talking and they're down. And your stomach is gnawing through your backbone and you're so hungry. But they start talking about what they're going through. And you start ministering to them and you forget about that hunger pain. Now, I know you've maybe never been in that exact situation, but has that ever happen where you've been hungry but then you start ministering to somebody and that hunger is no longer there it, it works both ways though really I mean because you ever been thinking about you're like going out on a date or something and you're you're excited about where you're going to eat you've got this all planned out and then you go see this movie and in the movie there's just some bad stuff just some bad stuff alright and, it, and it, it can be whichever way you want to go. Gory, graphic, whatever. Just the bad stuff. And it repulses you. And you ain't even hungry no more because it's burnt in your mind. Like you're, you're no longer hungry. Bad things can run your appetite. But good things, good things can quench that thirst, quench that hunger. When we're seeking God, doing His work, it fulfills us. It fulfills us. So, let's talk about this need here. The point is, the need requires love. The need requires love. How does the need require love? Well, Jesus was wanting to rest, and He sat down. And just like happened so many times to me, I'm just wanting to chill out. I'll get that phone call. It's time to go to work. It's time to go to work. This woman has this need. But Jesus, even though He's wanting to rest, He sees that need. She has this deeper need than just water. She has this need for salvation. 
She has this need for the Lord. So Jesus, even though he just wanted to chill, because he loves people, he ministers to her. He ministers to her. So many times Jesus would be on his way to go somewhere. He'd have something on his agenda, something to do, and a need would arise. And because Jesus loved people, he would see the need. He would see the need, and then he would meet the need. It didn't matter what he was planning on doing. This was what was important because Jesus loved people. And need requires love. There's so many needs in this world. And they require love because if we don't have love, we can't see the need. And if we can't see the need, how are we going to fix it? The need requires love. My daughter, Alyssa. Alyssa's 11. Y'all all know Alyssa. Alyssa, of all my children, is the most generous child. She is generous. Alyssa is always wanting to help. She's always trying to help out. Um, when Bella, when there's something going on with Bella, Alyssa's right there. Y'all know we had the Tylenol scare earlier in the week. And Alyssa said, now at night, if she hears Bella move, she's like, got to check on her. Because it scared her. She's afraid she's going to get up and do something. Because she's generous. She has a kind heart. When Alyssa has money, like Christmas and birthdays, and they go to the store or something, Alyssa buys them kids something. And some of the other ones just don't do it. But Alyssa, <laughs> Alyssa, Alyssa will buy the other one's stuff. When she has her birthday money, she buys, it might be candy or something, but she gives them something because she's generous. But get this, 11-year-old Alyssa, we were here Friday night at this lock -in. Alyssa sees a need. There was someone here who needed to talk to somebody, going through some things. And Alyssa comes up to me and says, Daddy, is there anywhere that me and this person can go talk? I said, what? She said, well, Daddy, there's some things are going on, and I've been through a lot of them. I've been through a lot of those things. Daddy, I need to help. This person has a need. And Daddy, I need to help. I said, well, I can sit over there and talk. So that's what they did. They went and they sat and they talked. Alyssa went at 11 years old ministering to someone because she had been through it. She understood. You know, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, where it talks about through our distress, others will receive comfort and salvation. Alyssa had been through some of these distresses. And so she said, let me talk to them. I know I'm 11, but my heart, I can feel it. A need requires love. And Alyssa, ironically, his middle name is love. Her name is Alyssa Love. And Alyssa saw the need. And she went and she met the need. That's, I love that stuff because in order for us to do anything, we have to have love to see the need, to sit down and minister to someone. We all need to be more like Alyssa, who is more like Jesus than I ever will be because she sees the need and she's right there. The next one is the seed. The seed requires hope. In verse 15 it said, give me some. The woman, she said, give me some so I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming back here. See, that seed of hope had already been planted in her when Jesus mentioned living water. That seed of hope. Now Jesus is a seed, but now she has a seed of hope. Now I remember... And I bet all of us did this. I mean, it doesn't matter how old we are or how young we are. I bet you all of us, right around fifth or sixth grade, I guess if we're below fifth grade or sixth grade, we're not going to know about this, but the rest of us, remember your little styrofoam cup with the dirt, and you put the seed in it. You remember that? You put the seed in it. Some of you maybe had a plastic cup, but you put the seed in it, and you are ready to watch it grow. And what do you do? You watch it. And nothing happens. I mean, what is this? And like all night long, you're watching. It. Nothing happens. You're like, man, what in the world? 
Yeah, you go back and check and nothing's happening. But you're excited because you believe in the potential. See, the, the seed is always about the potential. And you know something's going to happen. And you believe that it's going to take place. Hope is that thing that's not seen. In fact, the Bible says if you can see it, then it's not real hope. It's not real hope. The seed is in the cup. And you keep going back. You keep checking it. And then eventually, like on day 42, it seems like, but it's actually about day 7, you know, you got that little shoot that done sprung up, done popped through, and you knew it was going to happen. And there it was. You believed, and it took place. It grew up. See, we all have within us, if we know Him, that seed. He is that seed, and He is our hope. And we have that potential to just spring up out of the dirt. To spring up into the light. And what happens if you plant, plant the right type of seed when it springs up out of the dirt? What will it end up doing if you're growing the right stuff on it? Feeding somebody. Great job. If you got the right stuff growing, you can feed someone. Y'all, we have the Spirit of God within us. If Jesus is the seed of creation, and Jesus and God and the Spirit are all one, then we have the seed of creation within us. A seed that will create life. And it will raise up within us. And we can feed because of the life that's raised up within us and comes out of us. Are you seeing this? Are you seeing the seed that will grow? That living water that just bubbles up? That seed that just grows? Where you can get to that place in mature Christianity where it's not about like, what can you do for me? But what can I do for you? Because that's the way Jesus lived. Jesus wasn't saying, what can you do for me? Jesus said, what can I do for you? Let me help you. Oh, you need to see? Let me help you. Oh, your son is paralyzed? Let me help with that. Oh, you got a dead son. Let me help with that. Your brother died? Lazarus come forth? It was all about what he could do for others. Jesus stood up at the top of the hill and looked at Jerusalem and he saw the city and his heart broke and he wept because his life was about what can I do for them so that they will see who I am. So that they will see what I'm going to see. So, how can we get to that place if Jesus is the seed and the seed requires hope? How do we get to that place where it grows up to where we can feed? Because feeding requires faith. Feeding requires faith. It's the difference between having my needs met and meeting the needs of others. Verse 39, I told you. Or, no, I'm sorry. In verse 28, what does the woman do in verse 28? She leaves the water jug she goes and she witnesses. Immediately. She does not sit around waiting on something. She leaves her water jug and she goes because faith without action is dead. Right? So she has to get up and she has to go. She has to say, it's no longer about me. I came to this well to get me something to drink. But man, I done found something. There's a seed within me now. He is the Messiah. I don't even care about my drink no more. I got to go. Folks need to know that Messiah is here. Man, that is powerful. She came to have her need met by dipping it down in the water in the well and coming up and having a jug of water to drink. But she found something greater. And she took it and she ran with it. And that's where we got to get to. We got to get to that place where we're like John the Baptist, where we're saying, decrease me and increase you. Can we pray that prayer of John the Baptist? Can we say, Father, I need less of me and more of you. I need to do your work. I need to do your work. You know, oftentimes we're talking about, we're saying, you know, this message is pretty simple. It's not deep enough. You know, you're giving us this milk, and I want something solid. I want some real food. I want some solid food. Well, Jesus said right there, my food is to do the will of the Father. Guys, there is so much we can do. There's so much we can do right here within this church. Children's ministry needs help. 
Joe would love to have some help on connections. We can get out there and ask people. But there's stuff we can do outside this church. If you want to get involved in adoptions, Chris and Crystal are right there. And they're a part of the call. And they can get you set up where you can bring children into your household. We're, part, we're partners with the City of Hope Outreach. And they are trying to change this community. And you can get involved with that. You can be a part of that. Every other Saturday, we're in Brookside pouring into these young kids' lives, man. We're having a great time. Some of you are showing up. Some of you. When do we get to that place where we're feeding, folks? Where is that mature Christianity that says, I've got to do. I've got to do. That's where we're trying to get to. And I believe. I believe that on the cross, that's what Jesus is saying. He's pointing out this, I thirst, saying, I want you to understand that you take your need and you leave it and you go meet other people's needs. He's reminding them of who he is. He's reminding them of this story of this woman that had by, by this point in time, because that was early in his ministry, had become famous about how he met this woman at the well. And how many lives has that woman's story, her testimony, she went back to her village and her testimony changed lives in her village. How many lives across the world, across the past 2,000 years, has her story, how many lives has that changed? I can't help but wonder that. Guys, Jesus wanted us to see it's not about us. It's what can we do for others? Jesus was calling out that He is the rock. He is the water. He liked to say things that make us think. You know He talks parables. He didn't just all the time say things just straight up. Set them for a reason to make you think and understand and grow. Seek Him. Seek His kingdom. Seek His righteousness. Seek who He is. And He tells us very clearly that His meat is to do the will of His Father. To do something. I'm reminded, of, I'm reminded of when we started this thing. It's about that time, ain't it? It's about a year in. Man, when we was at that church, like literally, that church, I'm going to say the name today, we had this place and we were, we were happy there. Not all of you came from there, but we were happy and we had this thing. And we found out the doors were closing. And man, that hurt badly. Have y'all forgotten that pain? I remember looking around. I knew when they got to call me to lead a church. Joe and I talked about it. Chris and I talked about it. I've known for a long time. I didn't know how it was going to turn out. But man, when those doors closed and I saw y'all's hurt. See, I still felt like I needed to be under someone's teaching. In fact, when we didn't have a campus pastor there anymore, there was one time where I was like, I need somebody. I'm not ready to be out here on my own yet. Who did I really need? I needed him. I discovered that. I discovered that. And then, when I discovered that all of my needs were in Him, that He met my needs, and I looked out and I saw the hurt, the people wondering what's next, what are we going to do, how can this happen, it broke my heart. Next thing you know, we're at my house on a Wednesday night saying, yeah, let's start a church. Because I saw a need. And I said, it's time to feed. Because within me, I had to see. I knew I couldn't do it, but He could. He carried me that far, and He would keep carrying me. And you know, it's funny when we tie all this together. You see what it says right here. Need requires love. Seed requires hope. Feed requires faith. Faith, hope, and love. Everything that is needed is faith, hope, and love. It really is. If we will live lives full of faith, faith that God is greater and God has a plan, He can do something. If we have hope, that, that potential, hope that He will do it. Yeah, sure, things might not work out, but knowing Him, they can work out. So let's go for it, right? Let's run it. Let's do it. In love. Of these three, the greatest is love. Let's love some people.
Let's love them like Jesus did. Jeremy, let's love some people. That's what we've been called to do. How are we going to make sold out followers of Him? I love them. Because when we love them, we'll see where they hurt. I was a little worried. I'm running a little late, but i got to tell you all this. I think I need to know. I already told the league team. I did something outside of the normal paradigm Friday. I was in Walmart spending some money that I was authorized to spend for the lock room. And I met this couple as I was picking up a little bit of nail polish. This guy says to me, he's like, <laughs> I'm trying to paint your nails? <laughs> Well, no, no, the church where I'm pastor, we uh, we're having a youth lock in. No. Them girls are going to paint their nails. In. That right there was enough. There was a seed right there. There was a seed. They start talking. And the lady has him watching the new show from the History Channel, The Bible. And he's really digging it, and he's got these questions, and she's a little upset with the show because it skips over some parts. And I said, well, here's the thing. I think it skipped them because it wants you to know that it's from a book. And if you'll go read the book, you can fill in the missing parts. You know, it's something to intrigue you, get you motivated, get you going. It is a great show. I do recommend it. But it gets you going. So they're talking about it, and they start talking about a lot of things and where they're from and everything. I look in their cart and I see these basic needs in their cart. You know, I see some shampoo and some conditioner and just some basic needs in their cart. And they're just talking about how, you know, they've really, really started trying to trust God. They even had tithed. And God had showed up when they had tithed at the church where they went to. God had showed up and, and they ended up, they had a little money. And it's because of that money that they were blessed with that they were there buying the stuff that they need. And I have never, never spent any of our money, God's money, that we bring to His house without clearing it with my league team. But on that day, the Spirit spoke to me. I saw a need. And I told Him, I said, guys, I just feel it in my heart. How much more do y'all have left to get? And they're like, we got to get some paper towels. I said, well, I would like for y'all to somehow be at the cash register. When I get to the cash register, I'm going to pick up some snacks. Man, that dude, that dude turned beet red, tears in his eyes. I don't know if he was embarrassed, overjoyed, or what. But I know that we planted a seed that day. And if y'all tell me I didn't use your money right, so be it. But I know what God told me to do on that day. And man, we prayed in Walmart at the cash register. Not on the street corner for men could see because they needed prayer. And I had to go my way and they had to go theirs. Well, at some point, y'all might get to meet them because they would love to hang out with us. I don't know when it'll be and I'm not going to tell you who it is. But I saw a need. And that's what we got to do. We got to see that need. We have to have, to have eyes open. Look for ways to plant that seed. And guys, we have to live our faith. Live our faith. What was Jesus saying on the cross? That He is living water. He is Messiah. Will you, will you bow your heads? Jesus said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is you asked, who asked you? You would have asked Him and He would have given you living water. Let's, let's pray. Father, thank You that Your Word is powerful and true. I can only guess what You were saying when You said You thirst. But Father, if I look at the full compendium of Scripture and I see everything You try to teach us and I understand that You are always, always trying to teach. Always. And Father, I know that there was something greater. And if I know that You are living water, and I know that You want us to live our faith, if I know that You want us to seek You, if I know that You want us to love You, and that You want us to love people, then when we start asking what, Father, we begin to see it. And I thank You that You reveal Yourself to us in 
in such a way. And Father, I pray that this message today, Lord, that these men and women, these youth, Father, I pray that they will begin opening their eyes to see the need. The need is all around them, Lord, and I pray that they will meet the need out of love. Father, that they will plant a seed because they have hope. Father, that they will feed because of their faith. Our faith requires us to do it. It calls us to do it. Father, I pray today with all of my heart for my inner being, Lord, that You will inspire them to live lives that are not normal, but live lives that are holy and pleasing to You, set aside for You, living their faith for You, glorifying Your name. Father, I pray that this message will speak to them loud. And that when someone says they thirst, they are there to meet that need. Father, I pray that Your Spirit within them will bubble up and well over so much that they can quench the thirst of those around them. Father, I thank You so much for them. And I pray that as they go forth today, that there will be blessings upon them. Father, I also just thank You that my voice held up. Lord, thank You for all that You've done for us. And Lord, we know that the best is still around the corner, that You have so much more in store in each of our individual lives as we continue growing and seeking You, as we continue maturing in our faith. And Father, we also know that You have so much more in store for us together as a family, making up our local part of Your church. Father, we thank You for the plans You have, and we long to fulfill them for Your name and Your fame, for Your glory, on Your behalf. Father, bless us, and we bless You. In Jesus' name, Amen. Um, a couple things really quick. One, I remember earlier, or, uh, I guess maybe six months ago, the Lord Jesus, they don't even know what Jesus came for. So, right now, I just want you to know that if you know that you are not right with God, if you know that you've been sinning, if you know that you do things that are not pleasing to a holy God, and you've never surrendered your life to the One who came, He came for you. He loved you so much that He came to pay that debt because He was the only One who could. The only One, the only sinless man who was fully God and fully man, He came and He lived a life. He lived a perfect life. And He gave up His life on the cross of Calvary for our sins so that by His sacrifice, our debt could be paid. Paying off what we owe to God because we are not holy and God calls us to be holy. He gave His holy, pleasing life. And all He asks for us is that we submit to Him as Lord, that we confess He is Lord and He is merciful, He is gracious, and He is forgiving. And He will forgive us of that sin. Our debt will be paid for. So if you have never given your life to Him, but you believe that He came and He died for you, and you believe that on the third day He was resurrected, and you believe that one day He's coming back, and you want to say on this day, I choose this day, March 10th, 2013, to say, I'm tired of just knowing about You, but I want to know You. I submit my life to You, Lord Jesus. If that is You, let me see Your hand. I see Your hand. I see Your hand. If You'll just pray with me. Father God, I'm a sinner. And I know that my sin separates me from You. But I know that Your Son Jesus came and He died on the cross for my sin. And Father, today I give my life to You. I want my debt paid for. I want to know You. I want to encounter You. I want to live a life for You that is pleasing to You. Forgive me of my sin and fill me with the presence of Your Spirit so that my life can be set aside to glorify Your name. I belong to You, Lord Jesus. I'm Yours. It's in your holy name that I pray. Amen.